Right, really small, cheap cars are just the way to go. If you live in a city or a built up area and you're on a tight budget, forget SUVs, forget 4x4 dual cab utes or performance cars. These things just make sense. Now we've tried to keep the cars on this list as internationally available as possible. And depending on where you live, they might be called micro cars or city cars or super minis or maybe A or B segment cars. Basically, we're talking about cars that are smaller than the likes of a Toyota Yaris or a Mazda 2 or a Honda Jazz. And we've also tried to keep the price or the budget under 15,000 Aussie dollars. Oh, also, welcome to Redriven. And kicking things off, it's the Nissan Micra. While I personally have an almost unhealthy and profound love for the 1993 to 2003 second generation Micra, thanks to that particular Micra's almost complete lack of modern safety standards, the Micra that we'd be recommending for the majority of you is the 2010 to current fourth generation, and to a slightly lesser extent, the 2002 to 2010 third generation Micra, which, depending on where you're watching this from, might be called the March, the Vute, or the Renault Pulse. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room here. It's Nissan's CVT transmissions. Firstly, it is absolutely critical that any micro that you're looking at has a full and thorough service history, especially when it comes to the transmission. As we found that the CVT issues that are reported are generally avoided when the vehicle in question has been serviced and maintained to schedule. Secondly, unlike the host of other Nissan models that are suffering from major CVT failures, the micro seems to have dodged this bullet, unless they haven't been serviced properly and then all bets are off. Aside from those concerns and the fact that these generations of Micra make for a pretty mundane driving experience, the Micra is a decent little nugget. It has very good interior space for a car in this class, plus unlike some of its three-door only competitors, it is available as a five-door, helping with the levels of practicality. It looks pretty funky, it has a tight turning circle and with great visibility and light steering, the Micra is a breeze to drive in built-up areas. With pricing starting from around about $5,000, the fourth generation is highly recommended as the levels of tech and safety are noticeably better. However, third generation micros, when in good condition and again with a full and thorough service history, make for a very good alternative. Also, if you're happy to embrace some, uh, let's say, polarizing aesthetics, there's another version of the micro that you should check out. It's the second generation Nissan Cube. Based on the third gen Micra platform, the Cube adds a sizable dollop of fun and individuality into the Micra recipe. And it's even more practical thanks to its boxy silhouette. Next up and swapping out the Micra and Cube's slightly odd visuals for some very cool European styling, it's the Volkswagen Up. Now, if you just must have an automatic transmission and you're based here in Australia, you might want to skip through to the next car now because locally, these funky looking little boxes on wheels were only ever available with a five-speed manual transmission, which will either heighten the driving enjoyment for those that can drive a manual or frustrate or terrify those that can't. The lack of an auto in Australia, it might actually be a good thing as many of the automatic owners internationally have complained about slow and confusing shifting the older these ups become. However, besides that, and besides the few sporadic reports of electronic gremlins here and there, and the reports of all of the usual rattles and squeaks and interesting noises that come with tiny cars built on a budget, the up is proving to be a reliable little unit. The up has often been called the motoring journalist's car of choice as it feels like almost every car journal out there are either owns, has owned, or is looking to own an up. And fair enough too, because these things are so enjoyable to drive. Yes, they're a little out of their depth out on the freeway, and the ride has degraded a little bit over time, but around town, these things are just a joy. However, the reason that it hasn't made it into the top three is simply because of the cost of maintenance. While they may seem like great value for money with pricing kicking off from as low as three and a half thousand dollars here in Australia, the cost of parts and labor, if you choose to have it worked on by a Volkswagen dealership or a European car specialist, can quickly add up when compared to the next cars coming up on this list. Which brings us to third place, it's the Hyundai i20 and an honorable mention. Value for money wise, we're talking about the 2008 to 2015 first generation i20. And we'd be going for the slightly more attractive post facelift examples available after mid 2012. However, if you enjoy driving, try to track down a pre 2011 1.6 liter version with a manual transmission, as these things, they're genuinely really fun to drive but they are bloody rare. The i20 offers near class leading levels of practicality with a decent sized boot, plenty of room for all the passengers, loads of adjustability 
quality for the driver, decent levels of tech and loads of equipment in terms of features and safety. Even the ride and steering has been tuned for local conditions and these were built at a time when he and they were trying to prove themselves as a quality car manufacturer. So longevity and reliability is excellent. Negatives, well loads of owners do complain that the seat comfort doesn't offer a whole lot of, well, comfort and the pre-facelift examples are a pretty underwhelming looking thing. But besides that, these are an excellent little city car. However, he and they have an honorable mention. It's the classic old Getz. Okay, the Getz is a whole generation older than the i20 and it does certainly feel it. And they're not without their common gremlins either. And they're also lacking any real modern safety or infotainment tech. But there's something charming about this simple little machine. We just love a car that embraces what it does, avoiding trying to be something it's not. And the Getz achieves this in spades. You want a no-nonsense, cheap, rugged and a small car to get you from where you are to somewhere else? The Getz is going to get it done. As long as you buy it after you've watched our ultimate used car buyer's guide. Guys, we cannot recommend this highly enough, especially with cars in this genre. Watch our buyer's guide before buying any used car as it could save you thousands. The link for it is just up here and also down there somewhere. Okay, next up and from a manufacturer that is renowned for making brilliant and quirky little cars, it's Suzuki. And it's a model that sounds either like a pretentious health drink or a really dodgy nightclub. It's the Solario and to a lesser extent, the Alto. Actually, you know what, let's start with the Alto, and we're gonna be talking about the 2009 to 2013 seventh generation, which is also known as the Maruti Suzuki A-Star, the Nissan Pixo, and the Solario. Just not the Solario that we're gonna be talking about in a second. This generation Alto with its one liter three cylinder engine is one of the most fuel efficient cars available and also quite possibly one of the slowest. However, like the Volkswagen Up, the Alto proves that you don't need a fast car to have fun as these things are hilarious to drive even in traffic and around town. However, being one of the most affordable cars on the used car market, it does also equate to the Alto being one of the most sparse when it comes to creature comforts. It's not like a, like a World War II Jeep or anything, but we are talking the bare necessities. Which brings us to the car that we'd be recommending over the far more common Alto, its newer and nicer sibling, the Solario. Featuring a revised and updated version of the Alto's engine, the 2014 to current Solario is basically the Alto's replacement. And with pricing kicking off from around about $9,000 and Alto pricing hovering around the $7,000 mark for a good one, we feel it is totally worth spending the extra cash. You'll still end up with a pretty basic and simple little car, but the levels of refinement, technology and safety are improved improved over the Alto, while still retaining the same excellent fuel economy and enjoyable driving experience. Actually, if anyone out there owns an Alto or a Solario, and you live in Sydney or Newcastle or somewhere close by, and you'd be happy for us to feature it here on Redriven, can you let us know in the comments or message us on Instagram? Because yeah, we'd love to feature one. Also, if you're enjoying this video and Redriven in general, can you throw us a like and maybe hit subscribe and better yet, hit that bell button? Because the only way that we can keep making these videos for you guys is with your support and honestly hitting those buttons it helps us out so, so much. Okay, taking out this top five, it's the Kia Picanto. Okay, what a brilliant little car these are. We've actually reviewed a Picanto. The link is up here and down there somewhere. And while we were expecting it to be good, spoiler alert, it is bloody awesome. In that video, we featured the top spec and turbocharged Picanto GT, which here in Australia will be asking north of $18,000. But for this budget, you're gonna be looking at lower spec variants of the TA or JA Picanto from 2016 to, well, it's actually still a current model, featuring the 1.25 liter naturally aspirated power plant. And these are simply the pick of this segment. Okay, look, yes, with even the most affordable Picantos asking at least $12,000, they are at the more premium end of the pricing spectrum. But for the extra spend, you're going to end up with class-leading standards of interior fit and finish, locally tuned suspension and handling, excellent levels of safety and infotainment tech, a brilliant reputation when it comes to reliability, and with Kia's excellent warranty periods, many used models will still have years of factory support left on them. Honestly, the Picanto, it's a no-brainer. If you can stretch the budget, just get one. Even when used, they are still so, so good. Which either heightens the driving experience which either heightens your driving experience if you can drive a manual or I've gone blank on the rest, which either heightens the driving enjoyment. Fucking come on, Russ. And we'd be going for the slightly more attractive post facelift. Fuck you. Okay, so we want to know which of these would you buy or would you buy something completely different? Let us know in the comments. See you next week. Bye.